change the platform because a couple weeks ago I was called from a good friend of mine. Many of you know him, Pastor Mike Slater. And uh, I love that man. He, he did a lot for our family. And I still meet with him quite often. And uh, he's not going to be, he's traveling around the United States now working with his stretcher bearers ministry. And he called me and said, I have some condolabers for you if you want them for your church. I don't know if you guys realize it, but all these padded chairs that we sit on are from Pastor Mike's church. And so he's, I said, sure, I'll take it. And then a couple days went by and he says, you know what, I have something else for you if you want. And I said, you know, I'll, I'll see. So when I got to his office, I took him to lunch first, went to his office, and he said, I want you to have my pulpit. Nice. <laughs> you don't realize what this means to a pastor. Yes, absolutely. And what it means to him to be able to give it away. Mm -hmm. And it's a privilege to be standing behind it this morning. And I praise God for Pastor Mike and his ministry. And uh, I told him this pulpit's going to find him again one day. So I'm going to ask him to come visit us again and bring us the word. And, uh, it was so neat because on our way to camp, uh, Pam Rose kept saying all the way to camp in our car with Tony, and she's, she was saying, it's all about the journey, Pastor. It's all about the journey. And I kept thinking about that. And I go, it is. And then she said, yeah, the last camp I went to was like 10 years ago. And the pastor who did the camp said, it's all about the journey. And I said, we talked about the camp a little bit. She says, yeah, the guy was involved in stretcher bears. I don't remember his name at all. <laughs> so I got a chance to tell him that. He didn't even remember it. Once it was done, but she did, and that's what counts. Mm -hmm. And so praise God for, for a man who loves God and who's willing to pass on to the next generation what was special to him. Mm -hmm. And I hopefully I can do that one day also. So I just want to say in front of the church, thank you. But uh, also some have asked me to raise the platform a little bit because they have a hard time seeing me back there, so I raised a little bit to do that also. So we're trying to make some changes around here that are better for the church and better for you. And I appreciate those that move from the back up front a little bit because that's nice to see because we're trying to get everybody up, up, up front. So I appreciate that. How many read the second chapter of Daniel this week? Did you guys do good? All right. For those who didn't, you missed out. Praise the Lord. I mean, how many watched the, you know, we talked last year about the Sci-Fi Channel. You know, all the different monsters. And somebody like all those monster movies and stuff. If, if you missed out on Chapter 2, there's a dream about that. Because you, you know, you, you can get caught up into it. But the first week, we talked about heaven rules. Mm -hmm. And how there was these three guys that were, got, got uh, captured by the Babylonians. And King Nebuchadnezzar, they were brought in and they were kind of, Kind of forced to change some of their ways, and some of the ways they weren't going to change. They changed their names, which was okay for them, but they weren't going to change what they ate because that was important to what they believed and what God, God wanted for them. And so, ended up that God actually, you know, took care of them. Mm -hmm. And as we continue the story today, we'll see how they've been they've been in training uh, in captivity, and how even under this ruler that they still understand that God rules and heaven rules. And that's the way we're trying to live our life here, that heaven rules. Because that's really what it's about. And so many of us, even this week sometimes, maybe have thought maybe we rule, but we don't. Heaven does. Every once in a while, I come to a place in life where we, we really need to hear from God. Yeah. You ever been there? Yeah. Crisis coming up, something happens, and you can't like flip a coin to make a decision. You know, you can't do the pros and cons. You can't, you know, just ask your friends or relatives. It's like, man, God's got to give me the answer. Yeah. That's true. That's true. And then God doesn't give you the answer. Yeah. Or maybe He does, and you just can't hear Him. And that's where Daniel's at this morning. Is he gets into a situation and he realizes that heaven rules, so he's going to go to God with, it, with his crisis, his problem. And he does hear from God. 
And as we're going to find out, he hears from God because his spiritual well-being is where it's at, where we're supposed to be. And I, I know this for a fact. For the last couple of months, I've I've probably done more spiritual formations in my own life and disciplines than I have in a, in a little while. And just in the last couple of months, I'm hearing God more. Yeah. I'm beginning to see some things that he wants us to do. And I'm, I'm, I'm experiencing him more. And it's only because I've been searching him out more yeah. and spending more time with him. Mm -hmm. So I think many of us don't hear from God or don't experience him because we only go to him when there's a crisis. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then you're not spiritually well. You can't, you can't hear him. And you get frustrated by him. So we're going to look at Daniel's story, and hopefully it will encourage you to also you know, start searching him out in a real authentic way. You know, there's days that I, I miss reading and just like the rest of you. There's days that I miss praying just like the rest of you. But when I do, I get on my knees again and ask God to forgive me for that and to speak to me. And so the relationship is, is, is growing. But we're going to find out through the book of the second chapter of Daniel that faith does shine through. And that heaven rules and it is going to be the, the ultimate victory. Because Daniel prays, he hears from God, he hears God speak. And he interprets this dream that saves many lives. So if you aren't already there, turn to Daniel 2 in your Bible. Daniel chapter 2. Because I want to begin with this little insight that I, I kind of picked up. And I was kind of intrigued by it because I've never really looked at the book of Daniel as close as I am now. In the very first verse in chapter 2, it says, In the second year of his reign, Nebuchadnezzar had dreams. Now, that doesn't seem particularly difficult to understand. All it says is in his second year of his reign. But that second year kind of like intrigued me because if you go over to last week in chapter 1, verse 5, it says the king assigned them a daily amount of food and wine from the king's table. They were to be trained for three years. And after that, they were to enter the king's service. So how could it be that Daniel's trained three years and it's the second year of Nebuchadnezzar? The Bible's not right. And there's many who bring this up who try to who try to tell you that the Bible's not right. And they use this as one of the, I found out as one of the, the two verses that do that. But if you look more closely into it, in the in the in those years, in those days, the king. Uh, when he became king of the of, of the of, of his kingdom, his first year was called an ascension year, and then he began his kingdom. So, in actuality, it was Nebuchadnezzar's third year. It's the same third year that Daniel was being trained up. So, it it, it 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 does come together correctly. But I just caught that insight. Thought it was interesting to bring to you because if someone who's an unbeliever or who's trying to Maybe uh, speak some wrong things about the Bible. You'll be able to explain that to them now. They bring that to you. That's one of the verses that they try to, try to catch us. Okay. Well, let's look at some historical background here. Just to kind of give you a background of what's happening here. Uh, even if you didn't read the chapter, we're going to throw some of this stuff in for you. See, Nebuchadnezzar during this time, he 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 kept he kept he captured most of the most of the the, the, the the areas around him, and he was kind of going back through. And he was double checking everybody was paying their taxes and, and doing what they're supposed to do because what, what happens is a lot of money to put these armies together. It's a lot of money to, to when they get them in captivity, take care of these guys, I'm going to train them. So he's going back to make sure everybody was paying all that they should have. And during this time, never can ever continue to have this dream over and over and have this dream until finally it was driving him so crazy that he. he decided to call him all his wise men together. He brought them all together to decide, okay, interpret it for me. So go to Daniel 2, chapter, chapter 2, verse 1 through 3. Let's read those words. It says, In the second year of his reign, Nebuchadnezzar had dreams. His mind was troubled and he could not sleep. So the king summoned the magicians, enchanters, chanters, sorcerers, and astrologers to tell him what he had dreamed. When they came in and stood before the king, he said to them, I have had a dream that troubles me, and I want you to know, I want you want to know what it means. I thought it was kind of comical, but the wise men were the 
sorcerers, astrologers, and chanters. How often do we get caught up with stuff in the world like that? I think that that's the wise people. Just this little side light there. So here we were, bringing these guys in. They were trying to do service to the king and to tell him the dream. But over and over there, if you read this next few, next few verses, they, they kept trying to get the king to tell him the dream, the wise of the dream, so they could interpret it for him. The king said, I'm not going to do that. You tell me the dream and interpret it for me. If you, if, you, if you do that, I'll know you know what it means. And they go, no, 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 nobody can do that. Let's pick the story up. Let's go to verse 10. Same chapter, verse 10. The astrologers answered the king, there's not a man on earth who can do what the king asked. No king, however, great and mighty, has ever asked such a thing of any magician or enchanter or astrologer. What the king has asked is too difficult. No one can reveal it to the king except the gods, and they do not live among men. Wow. This story is getting better as we go. Since the wise men couldn't interpret the dream, the king decided, well, if you can't do it, we're going to put you to death. And I was, I was sharing this with Noe this week because I was looking up how the king, where people would put people to death in those days. Mm -hmm. And in those days, they would call what they, they called it quartering. Like a quarter, a quartering. Mm -hmm. Dave think, they think Dave knows what it is. And it's like, wow, I'm sure that I wasn't a wise man in those days. Because in quartering, what they would do is they would, they would go out of the forest and they would, they would find four trees about a foot or two apart. And they would get some rope and they would tie the trunks together as tight as they could. Then they would hoist the guy up who they wanted to kill, tie his legs and his arms to two of the trees, and then snap the rope. Now, I'm not going to go any further because I think most of us understand what's going to happen to those guys once they snap the rope. So, man, that was a demise for those guys. Could you imagine being hunted? Because what the king was doing, he told, he told the guy who was the head of all the there was an army said, you go out and find all the wise men and we're going to quarter them all. <laughs> wow. Because you can't interpret the dream for me. So Daniel heard what was going on. And I think it was Aragoth was the man who came and we ran into him. And the king wants to talk about all the wise men they want to kill and all that. So go to verse 27. Let's pick up our story in verse 27. Here's Daniel. He went to the king to find out what was going on here. He says, Daniel replied, no wise man, enchanter, magician, or diviner can explain to the king the mystery he has asked about. I love this word. But. If you have a pencil, circle that in your Bible. But. Because no matter what you're going through, but. Okay. I'll explain in a second. But there's a God in heaven who reveals mysteries. He has shown King Nebuchadnezzar what will happen in the days to come. Your dream and visions that pass through your mind as you lay on your bed. You see what's happening here is before Daniel even got into trying to interpret the dream, before he even got to talking about the whole thing, what's the first thing he wanted to make sure? What's the first thing he said there? But God in heaven who revealed. It's God who's doing the revealing. It's God who's doing the work. It's God who, 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 who answers our prayers. It's God who does all these things. Not us. We're just being used by that. And Daniel wanted to make sure that God was put out there first. And even in our, even in our own situations, I don't care what the situation is, but God is greater than anything of those things because we know here that that's the rules. That's what Daniel knew concerning this. So Daniel had to interpret this dream. Now he had to interpret it. After he knew, he told him, I can interpret it. Yeah, I went home, went to sleep. I took some time to think about it. Now, how many of us make decisions without thinking about it? You know, some crisis come, we just run right from traffic. You know, Daniel said, no, this is, this is big. Let me, can you give me just a little bit of time? And he went and prayed to God and asked God to reveal those things to him. And he talked to him about it. And he had it in his mind. Now he came to the king and said, I can do this for you. But I want you to know God's the one who gave you the answer. Nothing to do with me. Okay? That had all to do with all to do with God. So go to verse 27. We just read, I'm sorry. You can interpret the dream now. So go to 
So God explained about this about this dream. Here, 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 here here's a mind, in my words what the dream was about. And if you've already read it, you know what the description is. But here's what Daniel said. It's a, it, the dream is about a statue made of multiple metals. And Nebuchadnezzar's dream statue had a head of gold, a chest of silver, a belly and thighs of bronze, and legs and feet of a mixture of iron and clay. And coming towards it was a rock that shatters the whole thing. And God explained to Daniel that the statue is like a prefigurement of the future of kingdom, kingdoms. Who is going to reign on earth? Who is going to reign on earth? And God's dream reveals that Nebuchadnezzar's empire will outlast him and eventually be replaced by lesser quality empires. That's why, if you look at this dream, the head is gold. That's the Babylon, that's a Babylonian empire. And that happened from 626 to 539. Then there was a lesser empire that came in. That was a chest of silver. Silver is less valuable than gold. And that's uh, years 530 to 331 BC. Then there's a belly of bronze, which is the Greek empire, from 331 to 63 BC. And then the feet of clay was the Roman empire from 63 BC to today. See, the Romans were, were tough as iron when we, when we read about the, about, the, about the Romans. But they were kind of a mixture of of, of little uh, uh, worlds within the Roman Empire. You know, it wasn't just one thing. There's all these different things going on under the Roman Empire. And I think that's why they were, were, were the clay kingdom, where they had that mixture of things. And it's interesting that the Roman Empire was never conquered. If you read history books, it was never conquered. It sort of just crumbled. Yeah. Little by little, just like the dream. That Daniel was telling them about it. And this is all history for us now. And so many people get caught up into the dream. What's that dreaming for us? What is all? And you know, it's easy to get caught up in revelation about what's going to happen. And what I'm learning is we need to be more concerned about what's going on right, the, right at the moment. It's good to know these things, but what about me right now? And so I want to share what God gave me about what the point of the story is. Where is the story taking us this morning? And we learned last week that the stories were written in the Old Testament as examples for us. And there were warnings for us. In 1 Corinthians, we read last week, it says, These things happened to them as examples and were written down as warnings for us on whom the fulfillment of the ages is. So we need to learn from these things. We need to take these things, digest them, and, and really find what, what is the point of the story? What is this dream really all about? What's that dream, what does it mean to me? How's it gonna, how can it help me? And that's what we, we, we want to do. We, wanna, we don't want to get caught up in all of the, you know, different elements of it, but what's it mean to me? It's interesting because Middle Easterners in, in those days we write stories in patterns, and that's what this story is written in, this certain pattern. And that pattern is called chi, C-H-I. And the C-H-I in the Greek language is, a, is an X. It looks just like an X, that, that, that particular, particular letter. And so the point of the story here, we can find by the way the pattern or the way it's written, is where's the midpoint of the X? And that'll tell us what God's trying to say to us this morning. It's going to show us what what we need to do, what, we, what, what, what the story is trying to tell us. So in Daniel 2, I broke it up into five different acts, okay? Five different sections. In Act 1 is verse 1 through 13. That's the king with his advisors. In Act 2, verses 14 through 16, we have Arioch and Daniel. We came to Daniel, tell him what's going to happen and all that. And then we have Act 3, which is Daniel with God. That's when Daniel says, oh, I'm going to go to God and pray. I'm going to spend time in prayer with him. He'll give me the answer, and we'll, we'll move from there. Then Act 4 is Daniel's back with Arioch in verses 24 and 25. And the, the chapter ends at verse 26 through 49, where the king is with his advisors. If you look at that, those acts in that scenario, what's the midpoint? What's the point of the story? The point of the story is Daniel with God. That's where that meets, right there in the center. And what is Daniel doing with God? What did he go to God for? He went to him to pray to him, but he also took time to listen to him, to see what he had to say. 
And the example, I think, is written this way for us, too. When a crisis comes up in our life, when a decision needs to be made, when, when we're not sure which way to turn, we need to just take some time and with God in prayer and just listen to Him. I think that's what God's trying to tell us this morning is don't hurry along and try to fix it. Because you don't rule. Heaven does. And I already know what's going to happen. I'm in control, but I want to let you know what's going on, but we never want to do that. We want to try to run off on our, on our own. So this story is about prayer and about many lessons that are, that are placed into it. And I came up with four different lessons for, for this particular passage. First one is pray for the presidents or heads of states and his advisors. Do we do that often? Do we pray for our president? You know what's interesting about this story? Is God spoke to Nebuchadnezzar. God spoke to him, and he didn't get it. He didn't understand it. I, I, I know for sure if God was, if Nebuchadnezzar was a follower of the real true God, that when he had that dream, he would know how to interpret it. So he heard him, but he didn't understand it. I think how many of us go through our lives that way? How many of us, you know, that he speaks to us and we don't we can't interpret it? We don't, we don't, we don't get it. And in verse in verse 28, it tells us there, it says, But there is a God in heaven who reveals mysteries. He has shown King Nebuchadnezzar what will happen in days to come. There are driven visions that pass through your mind as you lay on the bed of these. He spoke to Nebuchadnezzar. And the God that was there then is the same God today. And I believe he speaks to our presidents right now, yeah. to the leaders of the country, but they're just not hearing them. Or they're setting them aside. Can't be. I think most of them aren't even trying to get their things interpreted at all because they're so full, full of them, their, 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 their own selves. And I wonder how many times in history God has spoken to leaders and rulers and they haven't really even realized. Just like that can answer. In 1 Timothy 2 1, it says, I urge you then, first of all, that request. Prayer intercessions and thanksgiving be made for everyone, for kings and all those in authority. We were called to pray for our leaders of our, of our countries, leaders of other countries. And I pray you're, you're praying for the Middle East situation right now. That's just going crazy. Second thing is a person who can hear from God is one up on the most powerful ruler in the world. You want to feel power? Stay with God and be a revealer, be a, be a knowing, just, just like Daniel was. I mean, look at what Daniel says after he gives the interpretation in verse 46. Look what he says. It says, Then the king Nebuchadnezzar fell prostrate before Daniel, paying him honor and order that an offering of incense would be presented to him. Just being a true follower of God, the king of the whole, everything of them, fell down in front of Daniel. And put Daniel higher than even himself because he knew there was a God and that Daniel knew him. Man, would you, would you like to be in that place? That you're one up on the most powerful rulers of the world. And just hearing and understanding God. It's, under, it's better to understand God than to rule the world. Uh, some of us want to rule the world without understanding God. It's better to hear from God than to rule the world. Amen. Amen. So I want to do that too. See, the one who can hear from God can know and respond rightly to every situation they face. It might not be the answer that you, you want. It might not be the answer you think is right. Or it might be the answer, well, I can't do that. But it's the right answer because God's in control. He knows. And you're going to have faith enough this morning when you, when you hear that to do it. I know this last few months I've really been trying hard. You ever, you ever pray and you get that little sense of, of, of something? And uh, Friday morning I was, I was sitting over here and I was praying and, you know, I was just, you know, God, I just I want more of you and all of it. I was just praying really hard to him about, about really experiencing more of him. And, and I just heard this faint. It wasn't even a voice. It was like just something came over. It's like, you're, you're going to know. You're going to know. And I kept, I kept thinking to myself, I can't be God. It wasn't loud enough. It wasn't sharp enough. The 
voice wasn't deep enough. I think a lot of us turn away, we don't think it's Him. But what I've been experiencing the last few months is I've been trusting that is Him, and guess what? That voice is getting louder, getting sharper, and it's getting more intense. Yeah. And how many of you did you just beg this morning to hear from God? You know, just to hear Him and know that it's Him. Well, if you think it's Him, guess what? It's Him. And trust it. Don't think about it. Just trust that it's Him, because it is Him. And God promises to speak to us. In John 10, 27, He says, My sheep listen to my voice. I know them. They follow me. He knows you better than you know yourself. And He's out there just probably yelling his lungs off trying to get you to hear Him. And you're so busy. I love Terry Warner because she really heard me one Wednesday night about listening. And so many of us, big, 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 we pray, we just talk. And I don't know if you noticed the last few weeks, but I'm trying to spend time even in our prayer time. It's a little bit of silence. Maybe hear God. Because I don't want to pray my prayer on Sunday mornings to you guys. Yeah. I want to pray God's prayer. Amen. And sometimes I need to pause. I need to listen for him. I'm trying real hard to listen for him. And every Sunday, it's a little bit more, a little bit more. And when God speaks, things change. Amen. When I speak, nothing happens. Okay, I've been there. I've tried that myself. It doesn't work. So when you hear his voice, how many has heard his voice and didn't think you were you were hearing his voice? You know, think about that for a minute. I mean, yeah, it's him. It's exciting. He's talking to you. You know? I mean, he's just all everything. I mean, if you just try to understand who he is, and he's taking the time to speak to you. And he's just trying so hard to please hear me this time. I used to always tell a story when I was doing training about when people would counsel somebody who, who wasn't doing their job right. And one of the techniques I used, the stories that I would tell was one about we would, the person I was going to talk to, let's say it was Dave, wasn't doing what he was supposed to do, and I needed to kind of wake him up to what he was to, to what he was doing because he wasn't getting it normally. And so I would take Dave in the back office, and I would sit him down, and we would have a discussion. And the story I would tell would be, you know, Dave, if there was a, if you were driving down the road, man, and you were going, you know, 60, 70 miles an hour, and you, you made this turn around this around this corner, and, and the bridge was out up in front of you. And there was and there was nobody there to tell you about it. You're gonna go off that bridge and it's gonna hurt. And I would tell the person, I'm here today because I'm that person on that corner going, stop, stop. I think God's that way for us this morning. Yeah. He's right there on the corner going, stop. Listen to me. Pause a moment. Just sit quietly just for a moment. It takes me a second to say something. But just pause one moment with me, will you please? I think that's what he's asking our church to do this morning. We're searching for answers, but we're not listening for them. We're searching for, for, for clues and visions and all that. We're not looking for them. We're busy talking and moving and thinking. Next one is prayer can change a lot of lives. And we know this as a church because there's miracles here by our prayers and by God changing them through our prayers. And how many people do you think were, lives were spared because Daniel took the time to go to God and to pray to him and get the interpretation? How many lives were saved because he did that? I think of young Tiffany. Maybe her life will be changed because we're going to go to God first. And we're going to give God that situation. We're going to pray for her. We're going, to, we're going to wrap ourselves around that family. We have no idea who they are, but they reached out to us. And that's God reaching his hand out to the Nazarene. And the only reason he reached out to us is because he knows we're a praying church. He knows we're going to do it. That's why that letter came here. Yeah. How many pastors deaths do you think that letter just went like that? Not here. We know how important that is. Amen. And I'm going to be so excited in a few months when we start getting 
more letters like that. We start getting more, more requests from people about like that because we're being responsive to what God, that's what, that's what God wants to use. Mm -hmm. God's going to use somebody that has a letter still sitting on their desk not doing nothing about it. He wants to use people who are doing something about it. True. That's why we pray this morning. That's why I already prayed for her already. That's why we're going to send cards or that's why we're going to even go visit the family. Mm -hmm. That's what God wants us to do. Mm -hmm. And God in heaven loves this Tiffany so much that, that he wants us to reach out to her for him. What a privilege that is. He called us to reach out for him to her. Wow. I just can't believe that. And James 5.16 reminds us the prayer of a righteous man is powerful and effective. And you really know the answer to that. It is. Number four, heaven rules. That's why we pray. If heaven didn't rule, why would we even pray? I think sometimes we pray thinking that heaven doesn't rule. Pray that heaven rules. Pray like heaven rules. Pray like there's going to be changes. Pray things are going to happen. Claim the victories this morning. Because God's going to do it for us. But how much do we really believe it? Yeah, how much do we really believe it? I've seen Roger change over the last month or two. Roger believes God's going to take care of him. And he's good to go. Whatever God has him to do, he's good. He's good. I see it in his eyes. I see it in his handshake. It's in his hug. I see it in, his, in the softness. I see it. I see it in him. And God's in control of him right now. That's awesome. Hope I can be that the way the day when I have my quadruple bypass. It's coming. I know it's coming. <laughs> God already, I already know. He spoke to me about that a long time ago. <laughs> See, even Nebuchadnezzar admits to God's existence and power. Nebuchadnezzar even said, I know God, God rules and heaven rules. And Daniel prays and hears from God. And that's how. But, but how does this all work? How, how did this work for Daniel? What are the, what are, how, how did he actually get there? Well, let me explain real quick. I, I came up with Daniel has some habits and attitudes that that enabled him to hear from God. First thing, he walked with God regularly. Regularly. Quiet place. Consistently. It's like a it's like a runner. If you wake up tomorrow morning, you're gonna run a marathon, you're not gonna go very far. But if you get up in the morning and you run every morning. You're going to build yourself up to him. And here, Daniel walked with God regularly. So hearing from God wasn't an unusual event. He was bold. Just give me a little bit of time. I'm going to go talk to the master real quick here. He's going to give me the answer. I'll be back up before you. We can say it over. That's pretty much what happened here. He was pretty bold. He didn't say, well, you know, can you give me a little bit of time? Because I'm not sure what I'm going to do. You know, my, I'll talk to God, but I'm not sure if I'm going to hear him. I'm not. He didn't do any of that. He didn't. He said, let me go talk to my God and give me the answer I'll give to you. That's what he said. Do we pray like that? Do we trust God that much in our own lives? I'm trying hard to do that. In my own human unworthiness, I don't do a very good job at it, but I think I'm doing better. But, man. Second thing is, he's open to God using him. Uh, here we go. But if I pray to God, he might tell me something that I don't want to do or I don't want to do. You know what? I'm just not going to do that. I'm not going to pray. I think God will do that. They get convicted by prayer. They get convicted by prayer. Because they hear God talking and they don't respond to it. In 2 Chronicles 16, 9, it tells us, The eyes of the Lord range throughout the earth to strengthen those whose hearts are fully committed. Wow. See, when God looks for people, this were committed ones. Once you're going to respond quickly to his, res to his response to you. And we need to jump on it. You know, Don, I would come twice this week. I was like on two different things, and I won't tell you what they are, but two different things. I was like, yeah, I'm not sure we should do this. And she's going, I think God tells us to do it. And I'm going, I'm not sure. I think God tells us to do it. <laughs> I think God's speaking through Donna to me. Amen. Amen. 
and we're going to do it. Not chair, so don't worry. <laughs> the air was going to go thick when I said that, so I was like, there, there. Are you open to God using you when you pray to God? If you really genuinely look at your life, are you really open to Him using you? In the way He's asking you, used. Not the way you think you should be used, but the way God's asking you to be used. I think that's a big stumbling block for a lot of people. As God keeps speaking to them, I think you should, I want you to do this. I don't want to do it. I think you should do this. I think you should do this. I don't want to. Pretty soon that voice just fades away. Yeah. And then you have a crisis. Oh, God, I need to hear from you. <laughs> I mean, you can't hear nothing. Because that voice is way over there. See, Daniel responded to everything. Like heaven ruled. And so he knew he was going to hear the answer. Man, that's the life I want. Mm -hmm. Wouldn't it be nice to have the, the, the one in control of it all? is going to let me in on some of the answers and know that that's the answer that's going to be better for me if I, and if I go to what he's asking me to do. Wow. How many mistakes could I have stopped if I would just listen to him over the years? Yeah. Next thing is he asked God to speak to him. In James 1, 5, if anyone lacks wisdom, he should ask God who gives generous to God. In your prayers, you ask God to speak to you. Or you're just praying and just hoping he's going to say something to you. Ask him. Speak to me. And then sit quietly. Sometimes I'll sit in that front pew for 20 minutes. Quiet. Until God, I just want to experience you. I really want to see you. I pray that moment. I remember about a year ago, I was kneeled right here on the altar. And some of you heard the story. And I was really down. I was, God, I just need to know you're here. I was crying that out. And when I lifted my head, I could see a shoulder there. Mm. That's it. It was gone right away, but yes. he showed himself to me. Mm -hmm. And he will when you cry out to him. When you really genuinely want to hear from him, he will. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But you got to respond to him when he does. Mm -hmm. Next thing, he does what God asks him to do. God actually calls on those that are willing. Why would he call on somebody who's not willing? Why would he keep calling you? You ever, you ever a friend like that, a relative, you keep calling for help and they never want to help you? Do you ever go to them for help? Never. You always, first person you call is when you know is going to say what you want to say, right? Or what you want to do. God's no different. He's calling on the people who he knows are going to answer him the way he wants to be answered and be used by him. But try to be willing. It's not easy. Try to be willing. So how can all this work for us? Well, the same ways it worked for Daniel. Walk with him. Be willing to have him use you. I want you, if you really want this to work in your life, I want you to start your, your mornings with asking God, use me. I'm willing, God, today, just use me how you would want me. And then watch what happens. How many are willing to do that this week? Every morning, God, use me. Hey, use me. I hope that hope those hands were up there to do that. Ask him to speak to you. you know, young Samuel asked, Speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. Take some time to listen to him. And do what he says. Matthew 7, 21, it says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Yeah, ouch. That's what we're going to be on. This isn't lip service. If God is really placed on my heart, we need to be genuine and we need to be authentic. Yeah. And we need to be transparent. 
Because we think we can hide things from them. We think we can manipulate them. We think we can make them rule the way we want them to make them rule. Well, if I just do this, this, and this, this, I know it's going to be okay. It doesn't work that way. He wants us to be real. And that's what I'm trying to do, is be real. And be authentic and be genuine with him and be transparent with him. God, I know I messed up, man. I'm sorry. And every time he wraps his arms around me, he says, it's okay. Picks me up and keeps me kicking the rear and keeps me moving. Because every time I get down, I always hear Barbara. Her voice in my background, the other person talks to me. Barbara always says, just keep on keeping on. That's what we got to do. Keep on keeping on. That's what this is about. So respond quickly the next time. Otherwise, if you're passive, you put it off, you're not going to hear from you. Respond quickly. Don't waste time. It says do this, do it. Yes. Donna spoke, or the God spoke to, to God this week about marrying. We need to do a luncheon for her. I said, well, we didn't have anything planned, did it? We're doing a luncheon for her. Even this morning. We'll be doing a luncheon for Marion. Okay. Well, that's what God told you to do. God's good. We're good to go. Yeah. Let's do a luncheon for Marion. In the same way that Noe prayed that prayer where God placed on your heart to give that $500 to Marion. Boy, how quickly it would be, and you could be, if you respond to God with that 500 bucks he told you to, could you imagine what he's going to do for you? I, I, I wouldn't lie, because you know what? Yeah. He'll do it for you. When your heart is right, and you're doing it for the right reasons. You do it because you love him, and you're putting him first. You're trying to respond to him. That's what's exciting about it. And God's going to make that $500 seem like nothing, like pocket change to your, to your wallet once you do it. You're not going to miss it. For whatever it was for you to give, I'm not, I'm not saying it was $500, whatever it is, if you guys tell me $500. Uh, God, did you tell me $500? <laughs> if he did, I'm going to do it. I tell you, I'm going to do it. I'm serious. I, mean, I, I learned the hard, that's a hard lesson to learn. And I'm not going to go back. When God tells me, especially about giving, I give it. I don't care. I give it. I don't mess around with that. I give it to you. Well, you know, there was a young soccer coach there. He wasn't even a coach. He, he was a father who didn't know much about sports, and he decided to take his son to the to practice. And the coach dropped off all the equipment, had to go somewhere, and nothing was going on. They were all they were just kids were sitting around. So he decided to set up a couple of cones and get some balls out and started kicking them around. Well, one thing led to another. And this man who knew nothing about soccer became the assistant coach. <laughs> and he responded to a situation. And so he, the assistant coach for a few weeks, and then the head coach said, hey, you know what? I'm going to be off this week. And uh, you're coaching. So he's a little nervous about coaching. And he decides to go ahead and do it. And first game he's out there, the, the kids are... The kids are running all over the place. They always get stuck in this corner. You ever watch kids play soccer? They get stuck in that corner, like a little pack. You ever see that happen? And so he's always yelling out, give him help, give him help, give him help. And he's yelling the whole first half, give him help, give him help. And he's like tired out. No one's really responding to him, but he keeps yelling, give him help. So at halftime, the referee came over to the young coach and said, you know, maybe you should change the phrase to help him out. Because give him help. Across the field sounds like you're not saying give him help. It's not like you're saying give him something else. <laughs> and so for the second half, he decided to say help him out instead. It didn't sound sort of like a profanity then. It was help him out. And he noticed during the game that some of the kids were listening to him. And what he was doing is he was, he was pinpointing those kids, and he decided, I'm only going to talk to those kids. So he's yelling at these kids to, to move the ball and place them where they want to be. And, and it's not like the other ones were, were not hearing him. But the other ones just were so caught up into the game that they didn't hear the coach. And as I read the story, I kept thinking about us. I think sometimes God's on the sideline just yelling at us. Some of us are hearing him and trying to respond. Some of us are so much into the game that we can't even hear them. And I'm wondering if we could just take time to, to listen to him. Because he's yelling at the sidelines, trying to give us direction, trying to show us which way to go, trying to, 
through the to help us and, and we we can't tune into his voice but what he found is is during practice he he started working with some of the other kids and some of the other kids started to because he was now the would yell more at the game because he was a, was a regular coach one time that more of the kids were becoming in tune with his voice and listening to his direction and the games got better for him and he kept using those same kids and growing and getting other kids to listen more you know I, I, I know God's on the sideline and he's yelling out to us this morning I know that and I know he wants to communicate to us this morning but I also know how the human mind works and there's so much going on in there that, that we don't know he's even calling us because we're so busy with thinking about what, everything else I got to do. And if you want to hear God, if you want to be able to respond to him, you've got to take time. You've got to be quiet at times. Because he wants to communicate to us. 